We're just going to play. Yeah. Yes. Come on. Up. So we're just going to play a minute or so of this uh, video. Um, and so you, some of you guys may have seen this video earlier. This this got a lot of uh, um, uh, airplay last week, but um, that was when they were testing inside. Um, so this is a flying bathtub, uh, and it, it just goes to prove that uh, with electric uh, electric motors, electric VTOL, you know, really it really is transformative. So you can do anything from a aquatic sport craft or uh, you know, an urban, uh, ur you know, urban truck, uh, or even make a bathtub fly. And, and that's, as we look at this last uh, panel here, uh, perspectives on, uh, perspectives on prospective markets, um, these are just some things to think about. That they're really, it's really, uh, electric propulsion really has thrown open, yes, yeah, so, I mean, basically it has really thrown up, thrown open the design space, and so there's, anything is now possible. Uh, but now we're going to look at you know why somebody would want to do this. And I just want to play another uh, minute of this till he gets to his destination. So for those who who got, you guys missed the beginning, uh, he he wakes up and he's he's looks in his refrigerator and there's nothing to eat in the refrigerator. So he decides he he's going to go to the grocery store and um, he gets to choose when he comes out whether he wants to take his BMW or his flying bathtub. And uh, it's just uh, it just it's the, the whole thing is about four minutes long. But we're just going to just get so he gets to his when he gets to his uh, destination. So you can see he did actually uh, get to the supermarket uh, to be able to um, go and land, and um, and he does actually buy something and then and then flies back. So <laughs> so let's just wait till he lands here and uh, we don't have to go inside where he gets his uh, meat and food and stuff. So, okay, so with that, um, again, so these are three different videos on three different uh, outside the bar box, uh, or this maybe this is inside the box, but these uh, different uh, transformative uh, uh, potential markets. And now uh, over to, to Jason for his serious discussion about potential <laughs> markets. That's a great interview. So I'm back again. Uh, like I said, I'm filling in for uh, somebody who's uh, just had a baby. Um, you go to the, oh, I got the. Here. Uh, so uh, this uh, this last panel, we wanted to talk about the potential market. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of excitement around it. Um, there's a lot of uh, opinion. Uh, I think some have invested in some more uh, rigorous scientific exploration of what the market could be, but a, a, a lot of those folks are uh, not speaking about it publicly. Uh, so we wanted to host uh, a panel that uh, would talk about, you know, what are the what is the market potential for the uh, the electric VTOL? Obviously, things like range, uh, emissions, affect the market size. What kind of customers? And then, um, uh, you know, is the propulsion like we talked about in the last panel? Is that a limitation to uh, what markets uh, we can serve? So uh, that's sort of just my opening monologue. And um, our panel is uh, Matthias Thompson, General Manager for Urban Air Mobility at Airbus, uh, Nikhil Goal from Uber, uh, Kevin Antcliffe from NASA, and uh, Dr. Brian German from Georgia Tech. Uh, so to kick it off, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Matthias. OK, well, thanks. Um, I brought some. Um, I brought some slides with a different and less scientific perspective on this. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just uh, last year we, we thought in addition to all the modeling, and we do a lot of that with all the engineers around, um, we also thought we should go and talk to people and said, um, do you think this is a good idea? And I'll just share with you some of the findings that came out of that. Um, okay. Yeah, so we, um, we did um, so-called like focus group. So we got together some relevant people uh, in China, in Germany, and in the US to talk to them about travel habits and the idea of um, urban air mobility. And this was done by a third party consultancy that didn't mention they were working for Airbus. Um, and uh, and uh, here, here are the, the two minute version of the out the, the, the outcomes, you know, so uh, objectives was to, di to find pain points, um, how people trade different modes of transports, what's the real need, use cases, 
um, what should the pricing and service delivery look like, vehicle, even vehicle requirements. They had lots of ideas about that too. Um, um, and uh, how should the whole thing be positioned? Um, as I said, four hour sort of workshops, which is quite a lot for this kind of work. Um, uh, people's emotion, um, we, we did target uh, people who travel a lot um, uh, so that we have some that are uh, relevant uh, decision makers and price versus uh, need. Uh, and as I mentioned, in the US and Germany and China, specifically New York, Frankfurt and Shanghai. Um, we met people and, uh, and we found out there are different types of people. Um, some of them are just hardcore speed optimizers and, and, and every minute count um, to spend less time is, is the ideal, so really a good group. Um, some are more on the predictability, reliability side because uh, they plan their time better. Uh, so for them, maybe the speed is, is less uh, valuable, but the reliability and the lack of congestion is very valuable. Um, and then uh, there's the third uh, one who wants to uh, get back into his comfort zone very quickly. So actually a lot of different groups, but also with different motivations and therefore different needs, uh, which are key when you define the offer. Um, yeah, the, the grading of this idea, and this is done by people who go and talk about new product ideas, uh, and they've done it for 30 years, and they've never you know, seen the kind of emotional pull this idea came with. Uh, so very high grades, very clear advantages, and uh, mostly questions uh, rather than concerns. Um, so that's nice. Um, uh, the flying carpet uh, does have a bit of cachet. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a group who actually thinks reliability is more important than speed. Um, so just the fact that you take out buffer time, jams, uh, et cetera, for example, this is an airport use case, um, is really, really powerful uh, reliability uh, over uh, whether, you ch whether you win the extra five minutes because you can fly a bit faster. Um, um, then you know, these, these are the, the ranking of the value propositions. Um, and number one and two is time save uh, and predictability. And number three is green. So green does help in the positioning, uh, which comes back to this whole idea of hybrid versus full battery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, and then a lot of other things too. <clears throat> uh, use cases, um, they all were quite unanimous that they said, you know, this kind of service is particularly valuable for airport transfers, which is uh, usually a trigger of a lot of uh, stress. Uh, people get stress out of making it to the airport on time. And so uh, taking that stress out from, you know, with a reliable and predictable service is very valuable. Of course, the sort of longer end-to-end -end city transfers, some off-site destinations, like for example, uh, in Munich, uh, you know, Airbus has two destinations, 45 minutes from the city center, big industrial sites away from centers. Um, uh, daily commute comes in number four. Um, and, and, and on that airport, just to make things simple, um, uh, you know, we actually try to size it up very simple uh, here for New York. Uh, more than 50% more than could be, uh, at least initially and based on existing behavioral uh, transport behavior, uh, city, airport city related. Uh, and, and the rest is enter and the taxis. Uh, and the last one is like uh, other type, you know, home, home commutes. Um, and if you look at worldwide airports uh, by distance, you get that 80% of the are within 40 kilometers of range, 90 uh, are within 50 kilometers of range, which is 22 to 27 nautical miles. Um, pricing, here's a good one, I like it. Um, cut my uh, travel time in half and I'll pay twice the price of a taxi. Just a good sort of um, uh, rule of thumb on this kind of stuff. And, and but what, what points out is actually that um, in China, they might be willing to pay six to 10 times the taxi. And at first we thought it was because taxis in China are very cheap. But if you spend some time there, um, you actually realize it's because the value of time, people's time is much higher. Um, they live uh, extremely busy lives and live far away from home. So the, the value of time is higher than we, we, we might think. Um, uh, on uh, sizing, um, uh, Two-seaters were considered appropriate in the beginning, um, while four-seaters should be the standard, and a six-seater would probably uh, lack a bit of exclusivity, exclusiveness. Sorry, uh, top countries. Um, just as just one of many congestion indexes, um, China comes in first. Um, Brazil and the U.S. are in the top five. Um, 
of cities that struggle from the worst congestion issues. Um, yeah, and they think Airbus has a role to play, which is nice. Um, uh, traditional aircraft manufacturers are seen as uh, very reliable providers. In the US, technology companies come out number one. Um, so I think that's why uh, we're all here together. Um, Air Taxi was a suggestion for a name that everyone would understand, and I think urban air mobility and um, and flying things as you know, as many names for the same thing. And Air Taxi seems to be what the people we spoke to uh, would want to call. It's understandable. It's simple. It's uh, trusted, uh, and, and uh, it doesn't uh, sound too sort of exotic. Um, yeah, that's what I had. Thank you. Okay, so while we're bringing up the slides, I'll mention I'm Brian German from Georgia Tech, and I've been engaged in the urban air mobility space for probably about five years now, starting, starting off in personal air vehicles when Mark Moore was at NASA, uh, looking at electric flight, looking at uh, beginnings of market studies and operations research related studies for, uh, for what's now becoming called urban air mobility. So I wanted to just give you a brief summary of some of our work at Georgia Tech in this area. Uh, just to highlight a few different things. We we could talk for for hours about this, but um, I was really excited to hear Matthias's talk on focus groups, because that's the first thing I'll talk about. We've done some focus groups at Georgia Tech to look at the problem of, of demand for urban air mobility, and uh, and we're also now keying up some surveys that are actually going to go live later this month in five cities across the U.S. where we're going to try to get some statistically significant data that can drive discrete choice models for, uh, for pricing. So we can actually look at, look at demand surveys and possible pricing. Um, so we'll talk about that first. And that's been in close collaboration with some uh, researchers doing travel demand research in civil engineering at Georgia Tech, particularly Professor Laurie Garrow, who's worked in the airline industry for many years. Uh, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about something a bit different, more of an operations research oriented study that we've done, but talking about a different market for UAM, and that's cargo. And this is passenger class eVTOL aircraft, like we're talking about in this session, maybe four passenger aircraft. This is not your delivery drone, per se. But what could cargo delivery look like there? What sort of markets are out there? And coupled in with that, I'll tell you just a little bit about work we're doing on uh, sort of a geospatially oriented tool set for doing operations and demand studies uh, related to UAM. <clears throat> So what we did is a lot in focus groups is a lot more narrowly scoped than what Matthias talked about at Airbus. Uh, we actually interviewed uh, participants in Atlanta. We did four different focus groups of the types you see listed here. We did high income households. Uh, we did a group of millennials with the idea that millennials would be more likely to pursue this travel mode than, than others perhaps. And then we were interested in healthcare. And Georgia uh, has some problems associated with healthcare. Uh, Georgia is a state that people talk about the two Georgias. You have Atlanta, and you have the rest of the state. And Atlanta, a lot of wealth, urban, blue. The rest of the state, not as much wealth, um, aging population, uh, red. And so there's some really interesting tensions that pop up in Georgia about, about this. And, and one of the issues is health care. Access to health care in, in rural Georgia is a challenge. So we, we did look a little bit of that, about that in our focus groups. Could UAM bring people to and from uh, medical facilities in the state? Uh, one thing I learned about focus groups, this is a really neat experience. I would encourage everybody in, out here, when we get in these echo chambers like this, <coughs> event, which I love this event, but we all have sort of drunk the Kool-Aid to a certain extent. Just go into a room and talk to people from the street about this, and wow, eye-opening. Uh, just a few quick comments that we had. I, I remember one that was very insightful, uh, a gentleman who, who's in sales, and he travels frequently. When we asked him about this, if he'd take this travel mode, he said yes. He had a very long commute way out into rural Georgia. Every day he drove about an hour and a half. And we said, oh, this would be great for you, right? It would reduce your commute. He said, oh, no, no, I'm not interested in reducing my commute time. I'd like to keep it an hour and a half and move farther away so I can buy more land and have a horse farm. <laughs> and, and I think that's important. I think that kind of thing is really important to think about, uh, broadening the, the, the urban boundaries. And 
when we think of that from the standpoint of things like city planning, urban planning, it's, I think it's really sort of exciting. So the results of, of these focus groups, I, I can't talk more about it now, but we have a paper that was out uh, at the Transportation Research Board meeting just earlier this month, and I'm giving you a citation here. If you send me an email, I'm happy to forward that along to you, or also to introduce you to Professor Garrow, who's doing work in this. Now, one of the purposes of doing focus groups in our study was to actually learn a little bit so that we could write better surveys that would give us statistically relevant data to do things like demand models and, and, and that sort of thing. So we uh, collaborated on putting these surveys together. Um, I mentioned Laurie Garrow, but I'll also mention Pat Mokhtarian in civil engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, her research is kind of interesting. It looks at questions about a person's travel personality profile. And I like the chart, the chart that Matthias showed where you had these four quadrants of different types of, of travelers. And that's effectively what we're getting at. If you've taken a Myers-Briggs survey, you, you might realize that you know, you're an INTJ like me, or you might realize you're something else, right? So if we can categorize people by travel behavior profiles, what, what does that mean? That might, might be very valuable. So uh, we formulated these surveys now. I mentioned they're going live later in this month. Five cities that you see listed here, San Francisco being one of them, Atlanta being one of them, our hometown. It, it helps us to calibrate ourselves and expectations. The number of participants, a little bit less than 3,000. That's a little bit more than 500 per city. That's not as many as you would want for statistical significance. But one thing that I've found in working in this space is you invariably get it wrong the first time. So you just go ahead and go at it with your best intents, and you get it wrong the first time, and then you go back to our friends at NASA or elsewhere and ask for more money to do it right the next time. So that's kind of lear learning all the way, hopefully. Learning all the way. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Chris. <laughs> uh, I'll talk now, just change here something very different, the cargo work that we've been doing. And, and this is in a project funded uh, out of NASA Langley. Uh, by, by Jerry Smith and Ty Marion are our technical monitors there, and, and Kevin can talk more about the context in which the study takes place. But our charter was to explore, okay, you have these aircraft now for passengers. What could you do for cargo? Is there a market for cargo? And they gave us a broad charter here to look at this problem in a sort of open-ended way uh, without predisposing the outcome, look for interesting business models, what might they be, and then do some analysis of those. So looking at uh, package demand, looking at where would you site vertiports, uh, operating costs, fleet sizing, throughput assessments. So that's the sort of thing we've been working on. And this is some intermediate results that I'm sharing today. I presented a paper at AAA SciTech last week, which I'd be happy to share with you with more details. Now, in thinking through this, the team and I spent a lot of time thinking about why would you ever do this? Why would you use eVTOL for cargo in an urban environment? And one uh, answer that comes to my mind is the value of immediacy, right? It, w else, why would you not take a truck? And by the way, uh, a self-driving truck, right? So they we're thinking about the future. So we, we tried to look at things through that lens of time-critical items. Uh, and one of the things that really occurs to me, uh, if, if you want to call this profound, that's, that's in the eye of the beholder. But uh, as an engineer, I'm very comfortable thinking about operating costs. And I always want to have the lowest operating cost solution. Uh, here, I'm actually less interested in that. I, I think you have to be, to some extent, cost competitive. But aircraft are just more expensive than, than ground transportation. So what is the real value proposition in terms of that value of immediacy is, can I, if I'm a retailer, for example, let's think about Amazon using something like this, can I incentivize people to buy things they otherwise would not have bought? That latent demand, uh, that induced demand aspect of it. And, and that can be exciting when you have the ability to, say, overfly traffic and, and things like that. Same story on the, the small package delivery drones, but now we're in a situation where we've obviously got to aggregate cargo um, more. We've looked at a lot of different models at a high level. Uh, I've categorized four here, uh, a point-to-point -point network, a, a hub-and-spoke courier network, sort of a regional network. And one that was, I think, is quite interesting, actually, is to get, uh, say, packages or express packages, FedEx, UPS Express, to the airport um, and allow a later last pickup time on those express packages. That is potentially an enormous uh, value proposition to some of those companies in terms of their uh, operations, sortment operations. So there, there's some potential in, you know, in those kind of things. But what I want to talk about now is we did one more detailed uh, CONOPS examination. 
And that was centered here in San Francisco, and we were looking at something that Amazon might be interested in. The basic idea is we have services like Amazon Prime Same Day, and we have uh, other services like the Amazon Prime Now, which is two hours. And the question I ask is if we could get, uh, get basically goods into the city quickly from the distribution centers that are to the east of the city, could we open up the spectrum of products that could be delivered within that, say, two-hour window? Right now, if you deliver things or order something with Amazon Prime now, limited inventory because it has to be housed in the city. But if you could suddenly access a much greater portion of the Amazon product catalog, what does that, what does that look like? So that's the study we did. And just I, I don't want to take too much time here, but I'll just show you the, the basic geography. There's a fulfillment cin center in Tracy, California. And we're comparing basically road travel times, which are you know, north of an hour compared to EV toll times of 20 minutes. Um, that's pretty compelling. So the question is, could you do sort of multiple back and forth deliveries per day uh, for, for, to a, a select few urban vertiports? A select few urban vertiports. Last mile, still handled with something else. Could be drones, could be whatever else you're interested in. And one of the first questions we said is, where would you put those select few vertiports if you were building them just for this cargo modality? <clears throat> And so we've built a geospatial information-driven toolkit where we can blend in airplane performance, we can blend in census data, and sort of connect the dots of, of, of building demand models out of where people live, where they work, what's the income levels, things like that. So we have a demand metric you see on the right, mapped over to, in this case, a census tracts. We could also work at the block group or block level. And we solved an integer program to say, what census tracts should I place a vertiport in Every vertiport could have a zero or one vertiport, a zero or one, uh, excuse me, every track could have zero or one vertiport. And basically, what we want to do is maximize the demand served by each vertiport. Um, and just to kind of show you how that looks, we said, how do you define demand served? Well, the last mile problem is still here, right? So you still have to get cargo from that vertiport to somewhere. So you see in the picture, the pink dots, the vertiport, the green area is the, uh, geographical catch basin around that pink dot that can be served in five minutes, or excuse me, 10 minutes drive time to that vertiport. So this has street networks. We have the Google API mapped in so we can, we can understand drive times. And what I want to do is place that pink dot so that the green area overlaps the most demand. That's an optimization problem I can solve. We solve that for here's one vertiport top left, two vertiports is going across the top row, three, picks up one in San Jose, four, one in Oakland, et cetera. And so you can start to see, you, you cover the map of where you go. Uh, we also later did some work on putting in airspace restrictions and airspace constraints following uh, some work that PK, who was here earlier, did along with um, Eric Mueller and, uh, and Ken Goodrich. And we, we basically said class G airspace, avoid the surface restricted areas of class B and C. Don't put vertiports there. That was our first cut at it. And we ended up something like this. Now we have an airspace constrained placement uh, of these vertiports. You see the upside down wedding cakes that extend down to the surface. Those are the, the red exclusion zones. And there's the vertiports. And then we're showing flight paths uh, to this Tracy, California facility. So just scratching the surface of some of our work we've done in this area, I think cargo is actually kind of exciting. But when you're talking about big airplanes like this, you have to be really thoughtful on what business models actually can compete uh, with, say, trucks in the future. Thank you. I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, Uber believes that the urban air mobility passenger transport market is going to be huge. Um, obviously, we've wrote about this in the white paper. We talked about it at our summit earlier this year. But given that this is a fundamentally new form of transportation, given that we've got 65 million monthly active riders on the platform today, and that number's only growing exponentially, who, uh, of, of people who would kill to go take an Uber Air to be able to push a button and get a flight. Uh, and that's something that's always remained exciting to us. That's always something that we've been focused on from day one. And all of our analysis tells us that market's going to be very, very large. We've done a, a fair amount of customer surveying um, over the last year. Uh, we've talked to our customers uh, qualitatively 
and quantitatively and started to really understand both in our, our target launch cities, which we've announced, which are Dallas and Los Angeles, as well as a number of other markets we're considering, what the size of this market looks like. And our initial numbers tell us, you know, this first and foremost, it will be a stepwise growth. You know, we've announced publicly, hey, 2020 is when we'll start demonstrator flights. 2023 is when uh, we'll be ready for commercial flights and then start beginning early scaled production from there throughout the next decade. And our numbers tell us that it's steady state. That means hundreds of thousands of passenger flights per city per day. That means fleets of a thousand or even more in larger metropolitan areas again in every city. Uh, and the effect that this has on cities is we're starting to figure out and starting to think about is tremendous. Whatever that means for the growth of the city, where folks are going to live, where folks are going to be able to live and where they're going to be able to work, what it means for the electrification of the city, particularly in conjunction with the other technologies that Uber is working on. Uber Freight, self-driving trucks, working on uh, self-driving cars, uh, particularly given the multimodality of Uber Air and, and what that implies for that overall city network. And so we're doing a lot of work on customer segmentation, on what the vertiports or skyports as we're calling them, what, what the implications are there. We're not ready to talk about a lot of it too publicly yet, but at our summit, uh, which I think we've announced is May 8th and May 9th, we'll be revealing a lot of the narrative around there as well as a lot of the specific analysis that our team is getting to. And then I think the other thing that I really want to stress is as we, as we think about this, one of the initial questions that we asked ourselves in the white paper was, is this going to be just a thing for rich people? Or is this going to be a thing for everyone? And really, if, if our answer turned out to be the former, it's not something that we want to pursue. And so very quickly through our analysis and, and really digging deep into the problem, we settled on the latter. And what that means is what's super, super important to us is that the price per passenger trip, price per passenger mile be as low as possible. And the only way you get there is through high production volume manufacturing of these aircraft, along with a number of other things, you know, the pilot costs, the operations, the, the infrastructure. But one of the key levers is making sure that our OEMs have markets to produce a large number of aircraft. So we remain resolute that our market will be uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, but we're also doing a lot of diligence to, one, understand what those other markets look like, whether it's EMS, cargo, personal ownership, whatever it is, uh, but also that our requirement set that Mark and Rob McDonald and, and their teams are building, those requirement sets don't pigeonhole any manufacturer into only building for us. We wanna make sure that the vehicles they build are, are essentially configured or configurable so that they can sell it to these other markets. And one of those key levers is the energy storage system. We've announced publicly, we've announced to our manufacturers that uh, we're not requiring, but we're, we're heavily suggesting uh, that manufacturers consider a, a configurable modular energy storage system. So for our use case, uh, we expect and mandate that the vehicles be able to operate all electrically because we fundamentally believe that's important to the Uber network, that if we're going to bring this new form of transportation to the world, it needs to be all electric. That being said, we want the ability for OEMs to swap in a uh, series hybrid in there to enable these longer missions. And, and we've seen those use cases for uh, from some cities. Some cities have asked about specific routes, if they can enable those on, on longer mission. We've heard that ask from cargo. We've, we've heard that ask from the OEMs around, hey, can I go sell this thing to other customers to enable those. And we're all about that because that gets higher volume, which ultimately lowers the price for our passengers. And so we've been really supported. Uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, one of the other interesting things that we've heard from our manufacturers is the technologies that, that uh, are essentially being brought to light, particularly around distributed electric propulsion and the lower, uh, lower noise signature and higher safety of these vehicles, I think is also applicable in the smaller form factors um, around drones and, and the transport of things. And so I think that's really exciting as well. And we're already starting to hear from some of our manufacturers about taking the technologies that they're working on for Uber Air and, and bringing those to a smaller form factor for a variety of customers. So uh, super excited about what the market holds. There we go, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to give a, a brief overview of what on-demand mobility was or is. Uh, so we, we had several workshops, uh, 2015, 2016. Uh, we brought in 120 plus organizations uh, to uh, discuss uh, what the future of, of this market would look like. 
Uh, so I wanted to kind of start with that and move forward into uh, really what we wanted to talk about today. Uh, so what is on-demand mobility? How do we describe it in that workshop? Uh, immediate and flexible air transportation. Users dictate uh, the trip origin, destination, and timing. Uh, one to nine passengers or up to a 2,000 pound payload as, uh, as Brian mentioned in uh, the cargo study that uh, we're funding there at Georgia Tech. Um, uh, two to three times faster than cars uh, and the hub and spoke uh, over a 10 to 500 mile range. Uh, so that's a, a much further range than what uh, Uber and some of these other UAMs are considering. Uh, we do feel like there's, there's still some, uh, some market to be had up to 500 miles. Uh, so uh, a lot of our, a lot of discussion and focus uh, of this panel, I think, is, is looking at uh, how do we enable those, those longer range markets. Uh, so the bottom left is a, a study we did at, at NASA Langley uh, in 2016 that showed this two to three times uh, difference between automobile travel and uh, this new uh, urban air mobility uh, type mission. And then the bottom right uh, is a chart that I really like to show as the difference between driving and flying and the amount of trips that are taken uh, per year. So you see over 2 billion trips are taken by the automobile uh, between 50 and 500 miles. Uh, and this is, this is really what we're trying to tackle uh, with on-demand mobility. Uh, if we can get 5, 10% of that, uh, which is a lofty goal, uh, then we can completely dwarf the rest of aviation combined. Uh, so one of the questions uh, in this panel is what, what is the market size, what's the potential market size uh, for on-demand mobility? And, and I think this really speaks to that. Uh, and then also uh, on-demand mobility is a range of missions, aircraft types, and operations. Uh, so the first thing we like to talk about is it enable trips that were not time or cost effective with current transport. Uh, we, we talked about latent demand throughout the day uh, today. Uh, and this is what we've traditionally called the, the conventional takeoff and landing commuter. Uh, I'd like to also opt in a, uh, another term there of, of optional VTOL uh, as well as uh, conventional takeoff and landing commuter. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the, in the next slide. Uh, secondly, an, a direct alternative to car travel uh, to avoid and alleviate city congestion. I think Mark mentioned a couple days ago uh, that if we just take a, a very small percentage off it's not a, a linear distribution as, as far as how we uh, alleviate congestion. Uh, so, so that's what we're focusing on there. And then lastly, uh, new and more rapid uh, methods of cargo distribution, which uh, is kind of your UAS package delivery. Uh, and as we, as we spoke back then and still speak today, this is a convergence of electric propulsion and autonomy and advanced uh, national airspace operations uh, to enable uh, these new markets. Uh, so the conventional takeoff and landing, uh, concept of operations, trips of approximately 50 to 500 miles. Uh, this is really taking advantage. We've got 5,000 plus public use airports. Let's try to use them uh, in, this, in this next market uh, that we're pushing towards. Uh, let's figure out a way to use electric propulsion, use autonomy, and use this infrastructure that's already developed uh, uh, to enable some new markets. Uh, and like I said in the last slide, enable point-to-point -point travel uh, and or improve connectivity to hub and spoke networks. Uh, and this is single pilot, autonomous, or, or remote operator. Uh, and then that, that chart in the, the right side there is location of uh, 3,331 airports uh, in, the, in the national uh, plan of integrated airport systems. Uh, and then kind of the, the reason for the pictures at the bottom there is we're really pushing for Right, what, what, is the, what is the market, if NASA X-57, the purpose of NASA X-57 is not to say this is the plane that needs to be designed to enable this market, uh, but it, it is a good baseline to say, okay, if we integrate electric propulsion correctly and well, uh, is there a market for that? Can that uh, make a big difference in, uh, in comparison to GA aircraft? And then uh, something that kind of has been the focus of the majority of, of the discussions uh, in this, uh, this conference has been uh, this, this urban air mobility. Uh, trips of approximately 10 to 100 miles uh, operate from new uh, infrastructure, uh, including charging, which uh, was a great, great panel earlier today. 
of the, the charging infrastructure that's necessary, especially on tops of building, having to unplug the entire building, as, as Paul was mentioning, uh, very interesting stuff uh, and, and a lot of challenges there uh, to overcome. Uh, and then this is also enabling point-to-point -point daily commutes and our package delivery. So this is what, right, affecting our daily lives, affecting our daily commute, where the other one is more focused on uh, business trips, uh, weekend trips. If I want to go see a Virginia Tech football game, which I would love to do much more quickly, uh, and that's kind of the last slide. Um, and then also, uh, if we're actual, actually able to combine uh, both of these, both the CTOL and VTOL, uh, operations. And I mentioned uh, earlier that this the CTOL could also be an optional VTOL, or if I were to say, so this is Hampton, Virginia, bottom right uh, of that chart, and I've got to go due west and then due north to, to get up to uh, DC and headquarters up there. Uh, instead of doing that, I could take a, a much more direct flight over a lot of water uh, to get to DC. Uh, and in this, I, I show OK, I can drive to the airport. I can take a uh, CTOL or EC toll uh, to, a, to a close airport up in DC and uh, then take a, a VTOL for that, for that last, uh, last leg into uh, the, the center of DC. Uh, and this, in this study, this was a very basic study, uh, but saves about 47% of your time. Uh, but also, if we have that optional VTOL, uh, where you could go and actually land in the center of the city. Um, then you could save energy by taking off uh, conventionally uh, and also increase your range uh, to, to then go into the city and, and land vertically. Uh, just some interesting thoughts and things to consider. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention on the previous chart, uh, looking at alternate missions. Uh, so the focus mostly that we've, that we've seen, I know uh, Johnny Dew uh, yesterday uh, talked about a lot of the public service potential uh, for these kind of missions. Uh, I think we really, uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that medevac is not more of a uh, potential market. I, I see it as a very uh, real potential market. If they see something flying overhead, public acceptance, right? We've got these flying overheads already. Uh, let's try to replace those early on. And uh, uh, it, it, if somebody sees that flying overhead, oh, yeah, there's somebody flying, and they're saving someone's life. Oh, yeah, we, we accept that. That's, that's easy, easy decision. If it's someone flying over and they're just transporting uh, and, and Uber saying they want to really get the, the normal person, and that's very true uh, and, and what we need to be focused on. Uh, but kind of initial, not, initial adopter there, uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to throw these up uh, from the ODM workshops uh, and, and kind of piggybacking on uh, what uh, Brian discussed earlier. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of research focused in this area. Uh, we want to make sure that we're prioritizing the barriers uh, that we're working on and uh, make sure that the research that we're doing is attacking those barriers within our reference missions that we mentioned in the, in the previous three charts. Uh, so these are, these are them. Uh, they are in prioritized order, uh, but any barrier can limit the feasibility of uh, overall ODM integration. Um, and then a uh, link there at the bottom right uh, kind of goes over all of the uh, ODM road mapping activities that we did uh, that have really uh, pushed forward into this uh, exciting space. So uh, questions, we'll have a panel here, uh, but uh, if you have any other questions that you're not able to get out uh, in this panel, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. I'd love to continue the discussion. Thank you all. So I've, I'm, I'm narrowed down to like uh, my most point, pointy questions since we don't have much time. Uh, I, I want to point this over to you, uh, Nikhil. How, how do you think the market is going to develop after the initial launch? And will it expand into more missions, or do you think it'll be more um, expanding to more markets? It's a, good, it's a good question. I think most likely both. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, nobody can say with certainty, but I think there are a few things, at least, that we believe strongly in. I think uh, the reason why we want to start with a very focused 2020 demonstrator uh, approach is to be able to show not only the feasibility of these aircraft, but the community acceptance. Because everyone in this room knows 
uh, helicopters have not been widely accepted by a lot of communities. And as we set out to write the white paper, it was essentially a foil against that and trying to figure out how distributed electric propulsion, how EV tolls would help solve against it. And so the goal of 2020 is not to go launch a ton of aircraft, but to work very, very closely with our OEM partners and our city partners and regulators to go launch a few aircraft and prove that it's not they're not only feasible against the mission requirements, but go prove to communities that these aircraft are safe, that the aircraft are quiet, that we're not darkening the skies, that, um, that uh, we're not sucking up a ton of electricity off of the grid, all of those good things. And I think as that happens, uh, there will be early adopter cities, there will be early adopter people who are excited to get into these aircraft, and we'll be able to go prove out the feasibility of this whole new market. And as that happens, uh, and it's already, uh, it's already starting to happen before single EV tolls flown in a city, right? We already have dozens of our markets, markets that Uber's already in, reaching out to us and saying, how do I bring EV toll? How do I bring Uber Air into my city? That's only going to continue. That's only going to get more serious and more concerted. And uh, we'll have a really great opportunity to work closely with those markets in those cities to say, well, what makes the most sense for Uber Air to go into next? How do we go work with those cities and our manufacturers to make sure we have the supply to build there. And I think the same will happen for additional markets. I think you'll have the military, you'll have cargo providers. You were talking about Amazon, Professor uh, German. Um, you'll, have, you'll have cargo providers, you'll have EMS services. Again, the, we're already getting those questions and that's only going to continue to escalate. And so I'm super excited to be able to start seeing demonstrator flights out there. And I think that will only dictate kind of where this technology goes. Great. Uh, Matthias, as uh, the representative on the panel from an uh, aircraft manufacturer, do you think uh, these types of, of designs that we're talking about are going to change sort of the cost structure for the operators between you know, the purchase price, uh, maintenance, uh, operating cost? Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around that and, and you know, how that's going to impact the price per mile that uh, customers can expect. So how will these kind of aircraft change the cost and yeah, price? Yeah, I mean, you, you think about the cost per seat mile in a, you know, an A, A300. Um, is, is the cost structure for the operators going to be similar uh, in these, these electric aircraft? Well, for sure, we... Um, we can see a lot of costs um, falling off, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's the pilot when he's out of the loop or when he doesn't need as much training or uh, the maintenance regime. Um, so yeah, we would very much hope that those cost buckets uh, uh, are reduced vastly. I think if they're not reduced to the absolute minimum, mm -hmm. the market actually doesn't take off. The, um, the, uh, the point at which it goes from sub 1% modal share to um, in between one and 10 is where you want to get to. And that requires every single cost of the whole process to be reduced to an absolute minimum. It's, it's, it's not going to be fun this if it's sub um, sort of 1%, um, even though that's also a sizable market in aerospace. Um, and I think we can only achieve that not just by making the vehicles efficient, uh, and, and low cost and mass manufactured, but the whole value chain needs to be compressed and we can't have a lot of um, uh, ex excess cost in, in anywhere, whether it's in the construction and operation of the vertiport, um, whether it's in the uh, air traffic uh, today. I think uh, just take the airport tax that we all pay when we fly uh, commercial um, is more than what we want to pay for, you know, would ru ruin the economics of urban air mobility and, and, uh, and a big expensive vertiport uh, would be expensive to own and operate. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's very sensitive and it's going to change the game from a cost perspective. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for our audience or are we done? One question? Who's the lucky one question? Anybody? All right. I, I've, got, I've got one uh, that I can ask uh, Brian. Uh, what do you, you know, you talked about the key factors um, that customers are looking for in uh, these types of vehicles. Can you expand on, on what you found when, when you talked to them? 
Uh, so customers in general, you, you mean for the passenger service? Passengers, or yeah. Just the focus groups and things like that. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, we, I guess, um, and, and your question was features, and we'll make sure I captured it properly. Factors, like, factors, you know, what factors, is it that yeah. they're looking for? Like, you, you mentioned that one uh, person who right. didn't want a shorter commute, they wanted to be able to get farther away from the city. Yeah, that's, that's right. I, I think, um, you know, we, I, I mentioned we, we interviewed sort of different uh, groups, so we were four different focus groups uh, in different ways of grouping, grouping people. Uh, one of them was the the high earner group, and and by by far and away that group was I, I think um, most interested in not just in the abstract, but but indicating strong willingness willingness to spend money even at higher prices than you know ground transportation, right? So they they were very clearly interested in this and what it would do for their lives. And we found that within the high earners group. Um, within the millennials group, there was a lot of interest in this as a wow, cool technology, and so we. One of the things that we did in these focus groups was actually to show images of a lot of the aircraft that have been publicly released and that you've seen in this forum, and basically ask the question. You know, I, I'd provide some context and ask, what do you see in these ink blots? You know, is this an mm -hmm. aircraft that? What do you think? What's the first thing that comes into your mind? And then what? Then later questions about would you fly on it. And um, you know, curious things popped out about that. Uh, the high wage earner group tended to be um, uh, an older demographic, because if you're making more money, it's you're typically later in your career. And that demographic said, oh, I like these things that have a lot of rotors and propellers on them. That, that makes me feel safer, more comfortable, because I understand what that is. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the, okay, there's a lot more of them, but I understand what a propeller or a rotor is. The uh, millennial group, interestingly, um, said, wow, I like that Lilium jet. It looks like a jet. It looks like it's high tech, and it looks like that's what I want to fly in. So there, and then, then, you know, there's a little bit of group think going on in these focus groups, because of course there's a lot of you know, five people in a room, and they develop a kind of group opinion, but surprising consistency in that. And it's something I, I really, really didn't expect. We asked questions about, um, would, would someone actually like to uh, um, you know, have in-flight entertainment or, or Wi-Fi? That was surprisingly no one cared over short trips. So just a few observations. They're just enjoying the view. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you to our panel.